The Jewish service of morning prayer, Shaharit, in Warsaw's main synagogue, led proudly by the chief rabbi of Poland. The fact that there's noise behind me because the people who are praying are now having a breakfast together is a sign that there is Jewish life. A resurgence of Jewish life in Poland, for many, a highly unexpected development. This was the country that Nazi Germany chose as the epicenter of a systematic genocide in which six million Jews died across Europe. We don't talk a lot about Auschwitz. Christmas. This person has a, has a gift. A great gift. We desperately needed a rabbi. He took Sabo in the fundraising. Oh, jeez, I said it in public. <laughs> A Catholic bishop is among the various public figures attending this interfaith service in Warsaw. The host, Michael Shudrick, chief rabbi of Poland. An interfaith prayer wishing that anti-Semitism will finally disappear. Change doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it takes time. But as long as you see you're going in the right direction, that gives you, gives you energy and it gives you hope. And it's that hope that sustains the work of Michael Shudrick. This is his office in Warsaw's Nojik Synagogue, also a home for the American-born rabbi. You, know, you never find what you want when you need it. The son of a New York rabbi, he first visited the country in the 1970s in search of his roots. His grandparents had left Europe before the Second World War. In communist-ruled Poland, Szydrych found a few Jews struggling to preserve what was left of their heritage. This is the diaries that I wrote uh, in 79, my impressions when I met different people. Remember one thing I said, oh, this person has the mezuzah on the inside of the door, they on the outside. You know, and I thought that that was uh, like being somewhat embarrassed of being Jewish. And I realized later there was a tremendous statement of being Jewish because nobody had it on the outside and almost no one had it on the inside. So, you know, having to understand what something meant here. After the collapse of communism, Shudrick, now a rabbi himself, relocated to Warsaw and embarked on his mission. His aim was to reestablish Jewish religious life in Poland. This is the first time that a Jewish prayer book was reprinted in Poland after the fall of communism. This is the original page, it was from 1926. This is probably from uh, 91, 92. Before that, there were few, if any, Jewish religious books here. Now, 30 years on, Warsaw has a flourishing Jewish school again with 200 students. This year, we'll see the first of them graduate. Joanna Niemierzka's children attend the school. Like thousands of other Polish Jews, it was only after the fall of communism that she started to embrace her Jewish identity. Thanks also to the dedication of Chief Rabbi Michael Shudrick. <laughs> the Jewish school has been a blessing for Joanna Niemierzka, her husband Lukasz, and their three children. Come on. Oh. Oh, that's very good. 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 And the man, minority here is a real minority. So it's, it's, it's real. Sometimes it feels like, you know, we all weirdos in our own country.
to klimat zaufania, który rośnie. There is a growing climate of trust. I think that's the most important thing. Obviously, there are still many prejudices and traumas left over from the Second World War. They've been passed down from generation to generation. The war didn't just destroy, or at least try to destroy, human dignity. To a great extent, it also destroyed the mutual trust between people, including the trust between the Jewish and Polish peoples. It's December and Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights, is approaching. The rabbi offers some guidelines to the teachers. An important question is whether to give the children presents at Hanukkah. A few hundred years ago, there was the so-called Hanukkah get. Children were given money to buy themselves something. Today, it's perfectly fine to give Jewish children a small present on every Hanukkah evening. You don't have to, of course. It used to be Hanukkah get, or some chocolate. We're living here under strong Christian cultural influences. The Christmas season is at a similar time of the year to Hanukkah. So let's give the children presents. Shudrik has been working in Poland for the past 30 years. The school is one of many funded by the American philanthropist Ronald S. Lauder to promote Jewish life in Eastern Europe. We needed somebody to go to Poland. Um, I heard about this rabbi named Michael Shudrik. So we, we, he brought him over, we saw him, and we said, this is the right person. We installed him initially in the synagogue, uh, 1990, 1991, and also was involved in beginning the school, uh, looking at mainly a kindergarten. But what's interesting is that the minute he got to Poland, he became much more involved with the community, much more Polish, and as he started to learn Polish. We desperately needed a rabbi, any rabbi. Uh, but Michael wasn't just any rabbi. I remember, uh, I don't know, his first trip, no, that was already Rechwaut, so it must have been early 90s. He just arrived after flying nonstop from New York or whatever, he was dead tired. But he still had a session with, with the teenagers, and they were pestering him with questions. And eventually, Michael, very tired, says, OK, guys, um, uh, tomorrow's another day. Um, let's just sleep over it. And he's trying to rise from, from the armchair he was sitting in. And one of the girls just shoved him back and said, you don't understand. We're the next generation of Jewish mothers in this country. We need to know everything now. Monica and Stanislav Karyevsky remained faithful to their heritage, even during the communist era. We had began before that, you know. We had much began earlier, much yes. earlier. And this is Monica's book, the, the second one, by the way, yeah. of the cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries in Poland. The Krajewskis researched this aspect of Jewish heritage first. Some 90% of the Jewish population of Poland were murdered during the German occupation. Most of those who survived did so by going underground or pretending to be Christian and losing their Jewish identity. These old cemeteries are a precious reminder of Poland's extensive Jewish population before the Holocaust. It was like an eye-opener. Open, Eye opening to you know that to the presence of those traces of Jewish presence of the Jewish past in my circle of friends, there were many who had Jewish ancestry, but we didn't learn anything Jewish. We didn't feel Jewish uh, when we were children because we were not introduced into it. The Krajewskis have been living their lives in accordance with Jewish traditions and scripture for two generations now. Their son Daniel was prepared for his bar mitzvah, the Jewish coming-of-age ceremony for boys, by Rabbi Shudrik. The chief rabbi is now off on a trip to southern Poland. He's constantly on the move. And sometimes that means mobile conferencing in the car. 
Today, he's talking to a Jewish community in Pittsburgh. Our next steps with, with Warsaw, um, and He's setting up an exchange program for young Jews from Poland and the U.S. I think the, our biggest challenge, um, they're very practical, and it's still, it's less, but still existing, uh, on follow-up, is we don't necessarily have the professional staff to follow up the way we should. With a plethora of projects to watch over, it often seems like too much for one person. Who said it was going to be easy? I could say that the Jewish community of Poland in the last 30 years has gone from a stagnating, dying, dysfunctional Jewish community to a re-emerging, vibrant, dysfunctional Jewish community. We're still dysfunctional, but at least now we're alive, we're vibrant, we're creating. Today, there are once again Jewish communities in nearly all of Poland's larger towns and cities. Optimistic estimates say the country is now home to up to 12,000 practicing Jews. This renaissance has led to a growing demand for kosher food. Today, Rabbi Shudrik is visiting three businesses catering to that demand. We're only welcome to film in one, the Pravda Vodka Distillery. The production line first or the office? Production. Jewish dietary laws divide foodstuffs into kosher and non-kosher. The chief rabbi checks production for compliance. Certain additives, such as pork-based gelatin, are not permitted. It happens to be that today they're doing a production for Israel, because it's not always are the stickers in Hebrew. So you could see all these stickers are in Hebrew, because it's going to Israel. After inspection, the firm is given an international kosher certificate. Vodka is a popular drink during the Passover festival. So this, this here, actually, someone, you see it signed in Hebrew by our kosher supervisor. It's um, with a, a lock here, here, and here, and here, and here. So we know that when we come back to do the Passover, the Passover production, that it really is from that alcohol. Most of the kosher vodka is for export. Only a fraction will stay in Poland. How important is this market for you to have a kosher program? Uh, Passover, yes, you mm -hmm. mean. Uh, Passover products, uh, the main uh, market is Israel. Also, we produce and sell uh, this product to uh, United States and to uh, Republic of South Africa. Uh, also, some amounts uh, we produce and sell to Poland. And still, uh, we are trying to rise up the uh, market for uh, kosher, for Passover vodka, and also, also for uh, kosher products others. So at least a share you are selling in Poland as well, which means there is a market uh, for Jewish people who uh, <laughs> it's not a big uh, community, uh, yeah. if you think about uh, Polish Jewish people, but uh, I think the most of people uh, don't know that uh, their roots are uh, from Jewish community. So I think that uh, this is still in progress to, um, to have uh, uh, information, to get uh, information about uh, their uh, roots and their generation. Very well said. Yeah. I'm very happy that I wasn't the only Jew who wanted to live as a Jew in Poland because otherwise it would have been very lonely. Uh, but if those Jews then eventually decide, and some do, that they want to live their Jewish lives elsewhere, it's their free choice. We're not making a religion out of Jews in Poland. It's um, not an obligation, but it certainly is a right. And it gives me also a private satisfaction. Uh, we're hard to kill, and I want to keep us that way. Here's another kosher certificate. I know the firm is just getting it renewed. And this is the confirmation for kosher distillation. Excellent. Thank you. I hope I haven't caused you too many headaches. <laughs> and the rabbi leaves with a present. Very important, it's kosher for Passover. So far, our impressions have been positive.
But Jewish Gentile encounters don't always run this smoothly. Let's go. Relations with the Polish government have been strained recently. The right-wing nationalist government introduced legislation in 2018 that caused deep offense to Jewish sensibilities. It made it illegal to suggest that the Polish state or people were in any way complicit in the Holocaust perpetrated by the Nazis. It basically was to de defend the good name of Poland, that Poland shouldn't be blamed for things that they didn't do. But there was then a great concern is, but there were Poles that did bad things. And how are we going to deal with that? And more, impor more importantly was the uh, problem that the reaction, there were hurtful statements. There were hurtful statements made by some Poles. There were hurtful statements made by some Jews. Protests met with a wave of anti-Semitic rhetoric in the media and on the Internet. The bill was controversial. On the one hand, Poles feel insulted when the press in Europe or the international media refer to the German concentration camps as Polish death camps. It hurts the Poles. You have to understand that. The Polish people themselves suffered during the Second World War. Six million of them died, almost 25% of the Polish nation. This legacy of the Second World War is embedded in the consciousness of generations of Poles to this day. After all they suffered, they are extremely sensitive to claims that the Poles were responsible for the existence of the death camps in Poland. At the end, there was an unnecessary problem that has more or less is no longer, you know, people remember it, but it's no longer a wound, it's a scar. When international Jewish organizations protested, Warsaw held discussions with the Israeli government, and the legislation was watered down. Rabbi Shudrick played a mediating role. But he prefers to focus on the positive aspects of life in Poland. For instance, that Poland is represented by people like Dariusz Popiela, a young kayaker who has competed for the country at the Olympic Games. Popiela is as busy as the chief rabbi, but he still finds time to get involved in the restoration of Jewish cemeteries, like the one in Grybov in southern Poland. This cemetery was completely neglected for years. We're going to try and improve things here. First, I'll launch an appeal on Facebook. We already have permission. I've been busy, and otherwise I'd have come to get this fixed up much sooner. Popiela wanted to clear the cemetery of weeds and restore its former dignity. Several months and a lot of hard work later, it's reopening. There's a new memorial plaque listing the Jewish residents of this small village who were killed by the Nazis. For Rabbi Shudrik, the commitment of these volunteers is especially appreciated. With our presence here, we express our memory and the Jewish Book of Life of the Gribov region was closed after several centuries in August 1942. On 20th of August, the Nazis started the Reinhardt operation. I would like to ask um, Chief Rabbi of Poland, Michael Sudrik, to say a few words. Shalom, dzień dobry. On the one hand, my heart is broken. On the other hand, I'm very happy today. It's broken because the Jewish people of Gribów were killed simply because they were Jewish. I would like to thank our mayor for his words. He said that we must oppose anger. We must oppose hatred when it is still small and before it is spread. At the same time, my heart is happy. Who would have thought? 
when the war ended 74 years ago, that respect would be shown to the dead in this Jewish cemetery once again, that the mass graves would be marked and remembered. In 1942, the Nazi regime finalized plans to exterminate the entire Jewish population of Europe. As in Grybov, German troops dissolved the Jewish ghettos in towns and cities throughout Poland. The Jews were murdered on the spot or transported to extermination camps. Projects like Dariusz Popiela's try to establish the names of the victims so that they are not forgotten. There are initiatives like this all over Poland. For the past 30 years, the restoration work has been focusing on a few more towns or villages each year. Michael Schudrick considers this one of his key tasks. Relatives of the people buried in Poland often come from overseas to visit the cemeteries, including from the U.S. Part of your family? Yes, these are my two kids, my niece and nephew, my sister, my brother-in-law. Okay. My wife's hiding over there somewhere. <laughs> Especially the massacres are so important because you know, we talk about remembering the Holocaust, and that's essential. Uh, if, if it's an obligation of every good human being, not only Jews, not only Germans, it's really an obligation of every good human being to remember what happened in the Holocaust. But if you think about that, then perhaps the first thing we should do is make sure that every victim of the Holocaust has a grave. Um, to the best of our ability. We'll never get close to having graves for six million Jews. But a hundred more, thirty more, even one more. There's a tremendous value in that. It's sometimes said that Michael Schudrick is the rabbi of both the living and the dead in Poland. We visit Joanna and Lukasz and their three children, Ezra, Rema and Ninel. Ezra was uh, at the Budapest for the students' exchange, yeah. And, 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 uh, and his uh, English teacher was very, very happy when he, when he came back. And she was like, oh, very good progress after this trip. <laughs> because there was the, the, he, he, it was no chance to speak, you know, Polish there. Joanna is an actress and recently appeared in a Swedish film. Her husband, Lukas, is a theater director and has been working in Slovakia. The couple value their international contacts. Lukas admits that living openly as a Jew in Poland sometimes makes him feel insecure. What was the tragic moment after war, after Jewish, after war life in Poland was the 68. Yeah. Because it was the moment when, and half of my family uh, had to go out, go out from Poland. 1968 brought further trauma to Polish Jews. Leading communist party figures blamed the student protests at the time on a Zionist plot, triggering months of anti-Semitic incitement. Many Jews who had survived the Shoah now fled the country. Half of my life, I, I was the pers first person who told that there is no anti-Semitism in Poland. But now I'm, I, I'm talking to myself where you had eyes and where you had the ears. Anti-Semitism is prevalent throughout the world. It may be worse in Poland, it may be better, but it's, it's prevalent. Um, a lot has to do with the Catholic Church. A lot has to do with just internet and hate speech and all the things. The but the result is that in a strange way, anti-Semitism in Poland propelled more Jewish kids into our school. And uh, the result is we became stronger and stronger. I wouldn't say that all members of the church participate in the dialogue in the same way. I wouldn't say that all members of the church are without prejudice. Maybe, actually, probably, some are prejudiced. 
But these are really exceptions to the overall picture. I'm thinking of the Second Vatican Council, which has had a direct influence on the atmosphere in Poland and developments here. Believe me, I have the feeling that something great is happening. The Jewish Community Center, or JCC, brings together Warsaw's five congregations. It's Sunday, kosher brunch for Jews and Gentiles. The food is good, and it's a popular meeting place. Parents can relax while their kids learn handicrafts. Rabbi Shudrik often comes here too. Joanna Nemierska and her children try to come every weekend. Daniel Krajewski is also here. Suffering from Down syndrome is no obstacle to becoming a fully integrated member of the Jewish community. It was very important to me that I could celebrate my bar mitzvah because I was born into a Jewish family. At the ceremony, I said two blessings in Hebrew. And after reading from the Torah, I spoke about the exodus from Egypt. Rabbi Shudrick simplified the bar mitzvah procedure for the young man. He has known him since he was a child. Daniel Krajewski took part in the seminars Shudrick gave in the 1990s when the Jewish revival began. The young Jewish community in Poland has made great strides since its beginnings in a small village in southern Poland 30 years ago. In the 1990s, Shudrick organized seminars on Jewish life at an education center in Richwald. Today it's a hotel and guest house for family get-togethers. This is the rabbi's first time back in many years. I have no idea. I haven't seen these people in 15, 20 years. I don't know if I recognize them. Maybe the same lady is working here. But we would have classes over here on the grass. Here we would sing, we would dance. We do everything. Trying in our own little safe space let people see what Judaism was about. It's impossible to, to, to be Jewish in Poland and not feel the presence of the absence. So of course it was a recurrent topic in our conversations. And of course we never came up with any extraordinary intelligent solutions to the problem because there aren't any. Decades after the Holocaust, many Polish Jews had become disconnected from their roots. There are all these stories that there was that was a time when people just realized, some of them yes. just realized that they were of Jewish Many of origin. them, right. Many of them, you say? Yes. And even those who knew never had a chance to experience it, never had a Shabbat before. Not Some, some did, but many didn't. And so it was really a first chance. It was also a chance just to be openly Jewish. You know, you didn't have to worry about anybody making a comment or wondering what it meant. So, and you know, in a lot of ways, it all started here. We had a dinner at uh, the Hotel Victoria in 1989. I looked at these kids. I looked at these, they were not kids anymore. They were, they were in their 30s or 40s. And I'll never forget, we sang a song called Rosakins mit Mandlin, Raisins and Almonds. And we said, we're going to sing a song that your real mother may have sung to you as children. All those from the hundred who remember the song or heard the song, please join in. And you know, first 10, then 20, then 80 kids, 80 of the 100 were singing a song from their subconscious, sung to them by their mother that they probably never heard before since then. Let me go say that again. A year later, in 1990, the Lauder Foundation funded the first Jewish heritage seminars in Richwald. 30 years ago, a kosher meal was made in this kitchen for probably the first time since the Second World War. 
At first, it must have been strange for you. What was kosher food, for example? Sure, at first, but then we got used to it. Exactly. After the first workshop, they knew how to cook. The staff got to know us, and they soon learned the songs that we sang in the dining room. They also knew what happened on Friday evening and on Saturday morning, for Shabbat. In communist Poland, Jewish life was an abstract concept. Before that, I only knew what I had seen on TV. We didn't know better. We were anxious about it. But that all changed when Michael came. And when children were listening to him, speaking about what, the, what was Jewish, what was important to them, it was so special. Because he related to them. He got down to their level. And he spoke with them. He sat, I saw him sit on the floor and talk to them. So I'm re him. This was the man, this is exactly the man who realized he was special. Stanislav and Monika Krajewski were two of the first participants. They were finally able to practice their Jewish faith openly, no need to hide and be discreet, as in the communist era. Stanislav even led prayers sometimes. Many of those attending were Holocaust survivors. During the war, they were children, so they were not adult yet. Some of them were very little children or babies. Some of them were, I don't know, eight or ten, and they survived, you know, either because they were hiding somewhere or they were given to someone. Both Stanislav and Monica were born after the war. This was very helpful to make me more, you know, knowledgeable and uh, to make me know how to do things that regular Jews do, because this is not something that I got from my family. And also this is true about all, all, almost all people of my generation and younger. So those who lived in Poland and were Jewish in some way in the 70s or in the 80s were mostly very assimilated and very far from uh, Jewish involvement. And we spent here, you know, eight weeks a year for six, seven years. The rebirth of Jewish religious life in Wonderful. Poland began under somewhat Spartan conditions. You know, um, it, was, it was wonderful times. It was, you know, very warm memories. And here, this is where we made our little synagogue. A makeshift synagogue was set up in an alcove of the education center. It marked a new beginning for Judaism in Poland. Everything from basic things of Judaism, Shabbat, kosher, holidays, history, to what does it mean to be Jewish, how do you feel about being Jewish, and then also getting to know each other, icebreakers, uh, and sometimes fun things. Re we have everybody reenact the biblical scene. And on Friday nights, we would put all the different benches that we could find and we'd have the prayer outside, which is really, I think, everyone's favorite moment of the week. But there was also criticism from unexpected quarters. For some people, Jewish life in Eastern Europe was unimaginable after the Holocaust. The fact is that Jewish people in America, particularly people who are second generation, whose parents fled the Holocaust, said, if parents fled, why do you want to do it? And I said to these people, because there are Jewish kids there, and we must do what we can to give them a Jewish life. It is ridiculous to protest against the rebirth of Jewish life where it had been murdered, because you don't regulate life. Um, Jews have a right to live and live as Jews wherever they want. If this is the only problem, then A, we need to get out of Europe. Europe is a graveyard. It's uh, particularly visible around Auschwitz. But um, if you, anybody with Jewish historical sensitivity travels around Europe, um, 
it is a place of death. And it was very painful. Very painful that after this journey back to be said that you don't really exist because there can't be Jews here. It was very painful and wrong. The seminar buildings where this Jewish Renaissance began are just an hour's drive from the infamous extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. And there's another point we should point out. When we go up this kind of bridge, you look to the left and to the right, and you'll see train tracks, lots and lots of train tracks. And then you understand why the Germans built the biggest death camp here, is because you have the crossroads of so many different train tracks from all over Europe. That, that, that's a clear point when you see it here. You understand, so why did they build it here? I would actually think it gets harder to visit this place than easier. Um, when it really became harder, uh, so there's, there were two things. One is once my daughter was born. So I think in a natural way, when you walk here, when you don't have children, you think, you know, could have I survived? And once you have a child, you think, could, you, could your child have survived? And there become, becomes a completely different experience. And the other thing for many, many Jews, it's, uh, I mean, this is a horrible place for any human being to be, but for, for Jews, it also becomes personal because many of us have family that was here. Gas chamber three, gas chamber four, gas chamber five, and this is the sauna. The rabbi travels to Auschwitz-Birkenau several times each year. Many visitors from Israel and the U.S. ask to meet him at the site where their relatives were murdered. He's also a senior religious advisor to the Auschwitz Foundation, which administers the site as a museum and a memorial. Rabbi Schudrich says keeping the memory alive is crucial. It seems that in Europe, the shock of, of the, the Holocaust, of this genocide, the worst genocide in history, um, kind of silenced those people who refused to learn the lesson. And it seems now 75 years later, while many people do know the lesson, there are those who never knew the lesson and who now want to speak in a loud voice about you know, denying the Holocaust, belittling the Holocaust. Um, so while some people are saying, you know, we've learned nothing, that's not true. Humanity has learned a lot. It doesn't mean that all of humanity has learned everything. And so even standing in a place like this, I'm hopeful. Because you just see the numbers of people visiting today gives hope that they will be changed when they leave. How can you be the same person? Michael Schudrich's uncle, an Austrian Jew from Vienna, was a prisoner in Auschwitz. Henry Starr was brought there in August 1944 on one of the last deportation trains from the German concentration camp at Theresienstadt in today's Czech Republic. Well, I saw what they did with some of the babies on the platform of Auschwitz. I will con they slaughtered them. They threw them up in the air. They shot them and they f came down like birds in front of the mother. I'll tell you. This is the place where uh, Josef Mengele, you know, would go like this. And my, uh, my uncle told me the story when they arrived on the train from Theresienstadt. In Theresienstadt, um, the World War I veterans were treated better because there was some level of Jewish self-government in Theresienstadt, some level, but at least there the veterans were treated better. And Menga, they were lined up five, 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 and they were in the same line as some vet World War I veterans. And um, Mengele sent the veterans straight to the gas chambers. And my uncle and his brother followed immediately with them, figuring they're going to a better place based on their experience in Theresienstadt. And then Mengele 
had his guards kick my uncle and his brother to the other side, saying that you Jew can't decide your fate. In other words, you couldn't even, a Jew couldn't even decide to be killed. And so ironically, Mengele saved my uncle's life, which is bizarre. Henry Starr survived Auschwitz and emigrated to the United States, where he started his own family. Michael Schudrick learned a lot from him. My uncle was one of those who, who spoke quite frequently about it. So I can't remember if I was 11 or 13. I would say certainly by 13. I, I, but I can't tell you, you know, from what age, but um, certainly when I was in high school, uh, this was something that, you know, Uncle Henry would tell me about. How important was this for your idea to be interested in Eastern Europe? Um, Does this play a role or not? I, ab absolutely, yes. To what extent? You know, the, the, the idea is that you just... I very much took away from that, I think took away from that, that you just, you can't be indifferent. If something is wrong, you have to try to fix it. Um. It's December, Christmas in Warsaw, the capital of Catholic Poland. The Jewish community is celebrating Hanukkah, the festival of lights. The opening event is, as always, open to the public. Warsaw's Jews are no longer a clandestine community. Simply put, it was the place I was supposed to be. Michael Schudrick has dedicated the past 30 years of his life to re-establishing Jewish religious life in Poland. He's committed to keeping memory alive and to working for the present and the future. It looks like it's still the place I'm supposed to be. <laughs>